What's good, YouTube? It's me, your boy Squiddy, back again with another video. Today, let's talk about how to beat Sky Striker. So, this is a very annoying deck that has been around for the past couple of years. And in the recent ban list, we just got multi roll back to three and also Sky Striker engaged back to two, which means that the deck is going to do a lot more drawing and searching throughout their deck and they're going to be able to set up easily with multi-roll whereas previously the deck was a little more fragile however this is one of the most popular decks of all time i think it's one of the most premier events uh in the history of the game so i think a lot of players will be coming back on this and the fact that it's decently good in a control mid-range slower meta game like the current meta i think it's definitely going to be seeing a lot of play so without further ado let's dive in and talk about how you can beat this starting off with the hand traps ash blossom joy spring obviously this deck does a lot of adding whether that's by their links so through shizuku or engage Generally, Ash Blossoms should be held for engage, obviously, but it really depends on your hand. So if your hand is kind of bad and Ash Blossom is your only card and your opponent starts and they start off by playing one engage, then maybe it's a good idea to Ash there. However, your hand is decent, then you could also hold the Ash and then only Ash when engage is guaranteed to draw a card. Because generally against that deck, you don't really want to trade one for one resources because all of their cards will allow them to um, get more advantage and then slowly whittle down the game where you're down cards. So you're kind of losing cards by dropping cards for a one for one. You want to kind of hit them where the choke points hurt. So a lot of times when they do add back engage off of Kagari and they have three spells in their grave, then you could ash there so they don't get the extra draw. So it's just something to think about. If your opponent doesn't have engage and they're just going into Ray into Shizuku passing, I generally like to ash here. You're, you got to play your cards so you can prevent them from getting to engage or resolving an engage for the draw because generally that's how they're getting the advantage between that and end phase multi-roll like these are the cards that you have to worry about because they're generating the most value right they're being able to add any copy of a sky striker card they want and then they can draw a card on top of all of that so we want to stop engage as much as possible so for our hand traps we definitely want to use them whenever they're gaining access to engage another decent hand trap is actually ghost spell and haunted mansion because the idea with this deck is they turtle up with their ray in graveyard and then they have the link monster so it's very annoying for you to get rid of you essentially need three monsters to get rid of a ray in the graveyard because you're going to need one to attack over the link monster one to attack into the potentially kinda that they special summon off the raid that comes back and then that prevents your second monster from attacking and then your third monster has to swing over kinda and then that's if they don't have any back rolls like widow anchors to stop you from attacking right so that's where a card like ghost spell and haunted mansion really comes in because it stops the effect of rose and ray in the graveyard so when your opponent uses this in the damage step, when you destroy something by battle, you can actually Ghost Spell because Ghost Spell negates the activation. And when you negate the activation, you can actually use those cards in the damage steps. So you are able to use Ghost Spell and Haunted Mansion in the damage step, whereas something like a Bistio or a Didi Crow, you could not. So that's kind of nice. It's just something to think about. The other thing is Ghost Spell, it also stops cards that they have in their arsenal, like Shark Cannon, which banishes a card from your graveyard or reborns it. So being able to stop that is also very important, in my opinion. And then on top of all that, you can also start up like some of the charmers, like Dark, if they happen to play that. And then alongside the Ghost Spells, you could actually play Bistios as well. These are very, very powerful against Ray because you put a body on board, you get rid of the Ray, you put the body on board, you can swing over the link that they have on the field. And in the end phase, if you have Magma, you can search for another copy of a Bistio. So like a Druus Worm, which could put a lot of damage on board, allow you to play through their board, allow you to push for damage, and then slowly um, acclimate resources, being able to trade off with their back row. So Bistios I really like as well. If you're playing a heavy hand trap deck and you have room for DD Crow, this is sort of the same thing here. But the nicer thing about Didi Crow is you can actually hit the spell card. So when Kagari goes the effect to target one of their spell cards, like Engage in the Graveyard, you can chain the effect of Didi Crow to banish that target. So it essentially serves as an effect failure against Kagari as well, on top of being able to remove Ray. The downside is you cannot use it in the damage step, so you would have to use it preemptively. Uh, for example, on de attack declaration, so your opponent might be able to respond with something to stop your attack, even after you banish the Ray. So uh, just bear in mind of that there. You can also use the effect of DD Crow to banish spell cards so they don't have three spell cards in the graveyard to resolve certain effects. For example, if they're going like an afterburners and you're trying to pop under your floodgates, you can chain the effect of DD Crow. They only have two spells on resolution in their grave and then afterburners only pops your monster and not the additional spell trap. Other hand traps, Nibiru is absolutely awful against this deck, but it's not completely dead. Oftentimes in a grind game, they're going to have to go into their links. And generally, there are the three links, okay? There's Hayate, there's Kagari, and there's Shizuku. And then there's a normal summon, which is a Ray or a Rose. So that's four summons. But anytime they deviate from the four summons, from the linear um, combo that they do, and they go into something like a Zeke, 
or a Kaina or like a Rose bring back or any of the other Charmers, then you know they're going for five summons. So you can absolutely nib there. And usually when they're ending on the fifth summon, they have a Shizuku on hand. So nibbing there does two things. It prevents them from searching from the end phase with Shizuku because you can only special summon Shizuku once per turn. And it also puts a token in their main monster zone. So if they're unable to clear that with something like a multi row or a field spell, then that means that all other Sky Striker spells will be dead. So if you're main decking Nibiru, it's not completely dead, but obviously game two and three, you definitely want to side this out. However, there have been some niche situations I've seen actually good players keep this in and good game two and three just to throw off their opponent because their opponent doesn't really expect it. But I think that's kind of niche and I would not keep this in game two and game three because it's really bad. Unless you have nothing to side out, like you've already sided out your worst cards in Nib, then sure, keep it in, but it's not that great. Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit is actually decent, but there's only really one target that you hit against the deck, and that's the multi row in the end phase. But it gets a little worse now that multi row is at three, because if they're a decent player and they know you're playing Ghost Ogre, they can actually activate multiple copies of multi row because the set effect in the end phase is actually not once per turn. So if they use the first effect to set and you Ghost Ogre and pop that, they can use the second effect of the second multi roll to set the same amount of spell and traps. So it's kind of a little worse there. But I think if you're already main decking Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit, you can get some marginal usage. They're not always gonna have access to multiple multi rolls. So it will still have some uh, niche range against the deck. I think game two and game three, it could be a card that you could still keep in because it's decent against multi roll. You're able to stop them with the ignition effect, which is only once per turn that allows them to target a card they control send the grave and then you cannot respond to their spell cards. So if you had something like an Ash Blossom and a Ghost Ogre, that could be decent. You pop the multi roll, so then it doesn't resolve. So you're able to Ash Blossom like an Engage or a Pot of Desires that's a follow up. For Kaijus, I actually think this is a really good card against the deck because obviously all of their spell cards need them to have no main monsters in their main monster column. So when you Kaiju, that puts that in the main monster zone and then all of their Widow Anchors, all of their Shark Cannons, all of their Linkages are essentially dead. So they can't use anything and then you can play like your entire combo, assuming they don't have any hand traps to stop you, put on a huge board and start picking off their back roll. And then you get rid of the Kaiju and attack for game or control the board state that way. But either way, Kaiju stop them from using their back roll, which is a big part of this deck, is using the spell cards to control the game in addition to hand traps. So turning off their entire back roll and then only having to deal with their hand traps is often nice. But it can be a little annoying if you're not able to clear the back row if the hand traps are too much because then they're able to link off the Amasu into something like a Zeke or just uh, potentially link up into an Axis code and start attacking for game. But I think Kaijus are definitely a decent side, depending on the deck you play. If your deck has a lot of gas and going second, definitely uh, side in some Kaijus if you can. And then let's talk about Ghost Mourner, uh, Effect Veiler, and Impermanence. These cards are actually very good against the deck because you're stopping them from getting engaged, right? Like remember we talked about, we're trying to stop them from getting engaged by any means possible. So generally when they go Kagari, try to add back that engage that they already activated or that they sent off of Hayate. Then we definitely want a Veiler um, or, or Imperm or uh, Mourner on this. The only caveat is if they're decent, they might go into the battle phase with the Hayate, swing, crash the Hayate, and then make the Kagari with the Ray in the battle phase, so you can't Baylor. So that's just one thing that you should keep note on. But you still get a lot of value. If they're going first and they don't have the Kagari play and they're just going to Shizuku, I would definitely Baylor, Imperm, or Mourner there because you, again, don't want them to get engaged by any means possible. Delaying them by engage for one turn is a big deal, especially now that it's at two, because that means they're not gonna be able to chain multiple engages on the following turn. Like if they're able to search the engage, they might be able to engage up to three times on the following turn because they have the two that are in their hand and deck and then the follow up with Kagari. Kagari, right? So we want to prevent them from getting engaged. We want to slow them down as much as possible. Each turn is very important for Sky Striker because it's a control based deck and they're only able to special summon the links once per turn. So stopping them one whole turn is a big deal from getting to engage and forces them to send the engage off the Hayate and instead of something else that they would normally send to fuel the engage that they searched already. And then there's some other cards like Troll Knockbird. I definitely think this card is not very good against this deck. Even though engages at two, it's just a negative one, right? Like we talked about not wanting to neg against this deck. And the thing with Drone Knockbird is you're not even trading one for one. You're hard negging on the card after they add a card. And if they're playing with multi roll, like we talked about in the Skies Tracker Tips video, they can actually play around your Drone Knockbird by sending something to activate multi roll and then activating a quick play spell card on the immediate resolution of any spell card that allows them to add a card from their deck to their hand, which means that you cannot respond so you could not Drone Knockbird in that timing. So I think Drone Knockbird is pretty horrible. If you're playing it in your main deck, definitely side it out against this deck. It's not something you want. But if you're playing a deck that doesn't require the graveyard, then Shifter is amazing against this deck because this deck requires you to have 
spell cards in your graveyard in order to get the effects of Gagari, in order to get the secondary effects, in order to set them off a multi-roll, so on and so forth. So stopping them two turns with Shifter is very, very nice, in my opinion. I would definitely side it against the deck if you're playing something like Keshtira. And for the deck set, do rely more on the graveyard, you can actually side Retaliating C. What this does is when your opponent activates a spell card that includes the effect of Special Summoning a monster, you Special Summon Retaliating C from your hand. And while it's on the board, while it's Special Summoned by its own effect, it's effectively a macro cosmos, so every card gets banished instead of being sent to the grave. And Sky Striker actually has a couple cards that actually allows them to Special Summon. First and foremost, Shark Cannon. This allows them to target a card in your their, your, their opponent's graveyard, so your graveyard, and then they can special summon it if they have three or more spells. However, you can still chain Retaliating C even if Shark Cannon uh, is activated and they have less than three spell cards in their graveyard because upon the resolution, they might have three. So that's how the ruling that works for there. And then you chain it, you special summon it, Shark Cannon gets banished so they don't get spell cards in their grave to add back. And it's really hard for them to get rid of the Retaliating C without attacking it. Um, and it just really trades quite fair. It's a lot nicer, obviously, with Retaliating C if you have a target to search, so it's just not a hard minus. You recruit that advantage after it's in the graveyard, but that's still all right. It's still a body. It's a level four, so it's decent. Another thing is Linkage, also special summon, so you can chain Retaliating C to linkage, and that could hurt them as well because they're not being able to add back the linkage. And then you have their tallying C on your turn as a body, so you can start threatening that Shizuku. And then back row board, board breakers are definitely good against this deck. Things like Cosmic Cyclone because uh, how strong multi roll is. I generally like to hold the Cosmic Cyclones in my hand. This is the one thing that you guys have to realize is with cards like Cosmic Cyclone and like MST and Twin Twisters, you should never be setting them against this deck for the most part unless. Um, unless like you have other hand traps, other ways to uh, disrupt your opponent, or if you're desperate, then you have to set it. But a lot of times you might wanna hold this in your hand because if they have three spells, they might activate something like a afterburners and then just pop your monster and pop your cosmic before they start their plays. So you kind of have to like generalize and see, uh, depending on your deck, depending on your hand, obviously it is quite decent to set it and they hit the multi-roll so they can't use the effect that prevents you from responding. But generally I like to hold these cards in my hand and then use them when I need them. So I know when they have like a Widow Anchor set, I can target that and get rid of it. Uh, I know I can just set it uh, for a follow-up and then use it on multi-roll after I've whittled away the resources and then I'm forced to. Um, but I don't want it to get popped immediately off of their spell cards and I don't want to expose it on the field when I don't have to. So just be very careful when playing Cosmic Cyclone. Only use it against their engine when you're absolutely forced to. So when they're resolving the multi-roll to set a bunch of cards, for example, or if they're preventing you from responding when you have Ash, then you should use it. Yeah, sure. Um, but you could also use your Cosmic Cyclone against other cards that they have set, like Widow Anchor. And if they're playing Floodgates as well, like a lot of Sky Strikers are actually playing There Can Be Only One. So be very careful about how you activate your cards. And I think that's also a nice thing to mention about Ash is you should be very careful on how you use this because if you're playing a Sky Striker Mirror, there are actually cards like Shared Ride that are very big blowouts in the deck. So you should traditionally possibly consider holding this for Shared Ride specifically in the Mirror Match because you know that's going to set you multiple turns behind. So instead of using it on Engage, you might want to hold it for Shared Ride, for example. So just like think about those things when you're playing uh, in the Mirror Match. And then other board breakers is actually Lightning Storm. I think this is very good. Like Harpy's Feather Duster, you just clear their back row and then you're able to play. The only thing you really have to deal with is the Ray in the Graveyard and any hand traps that they have. So Lightning Storm, I think I actually really like against this deck because you can use it very proactively to clear their back row, clear all the cards that they've set up multi row, and then everything gets banished as well. So it's really nice interaction there. And then we just kind of briefly glimpsed over this, but Shared Ride, I've been really big on this card because I like it. I feel like it's a pseudo maxi. Against this deck, it's very, very good because Kagari adds from Graveyard, so you're able to draw a card. Against Shizuku, you're able to draw a card. Against Engage, well, yeah, Engage, you're able to draw a card. And then uh, any other card, like the Field Spell, um, any other card like Pot of Prosperity will allow you to get that value. You can chain it and then draw a card and then their subsequent Kagaris and Shizukus will lose value because if they're going to do that, then you're going to equalize by drawing a card. So it's really, really nice in that matchup. And because the deck is so grindy, you could even afford to side it in going second and then grind against their deck and then set Shared Ride. It could be very, very powerful. So it's not only a going first card in my opinion. Other cards that you could play is actually Forbidden Lance if you're playing like Ashtira because all of their cards target, right? Like the spell cards, Widow Anchor, they're all like spell cards that affect your monster. So being able to stop them by chaining a Forbidden Lance is often very crucial. Being able to save your monster from Afterburners. And to an extent, if you're also playing Forbidden Chalice, this is a card that could be very effective as well because you're able to negate their Link monsters, but you're also able to chain it onto your own monster when they try to steal it with Widow Anchor because Widow Anchor has to negate a monster's effect in order to take it. So if you chain something like Forbidden Chalice, target 
your monster that they're trying to steal. Then it resolves backwards and your monster's effects negated, so then they're not able to steal and Widow Anchor will resolve without effect. So that's just kind of cool interaction here with Forbidden Chalice that I really like a lot. Um, I know not a lot of decks are playing it, but it could be something that you guys consider because the Rise Heart's also in the metagame, so it has some crossover utility there. Other board breakers going second, even the match is okay against the deck as well, because if you get rid of their link monsters, they're not going to be able to special summon back Ray, because Ray says that your opponent has to remove that link monster, but even the match says that um, the player is banishing the cards. So instead of you being the activator of evenly match banishing that link, it's actually your opponent that's banishing the link, so they do not get Ray. So they're kind of choose, they're kind of forced to either keep the link monster or they're gonna have to keep one of their back rolls like a widow anchor, which is often the play. So you get to get rid of every card, every card they set off multi-roll. Uh, there's a lot of value there in my opinion. And then going first, there are actually a lot of blowout cards against this deck. We just talked about one, which is Shared Ride, but there are also some powerful traps like Anti-Spell Fragrance. Previously, we knew that Imperial Order was a death sentence for Sky Strikers, so Anti-Spell Fragrance basically does the same thing. They're gonna have to set all their cards. They're able to activate certain cards, like if they have Linkage plus an, another Quick Play spell, then yeah, they can get a monster on board, but it's gonna stop the rest of their turn. They're not gonna be able to activate Engage, which is the card that we really fear in this deck, because that's how they accrue most advantage. So being able to anti-spell and floodgate them before they activate their engages is very, very good. And then on the following turn, you pop all the cards they set and you win the game. Same with Magic Deflector. They play a lot of continuous spell and trap cards. So we have continuous spell cards in multi-roll, the field spell, area zero, um, shark cannon, widow anchor, linkage. These are all quick play spell cards and Magic Deflector negates everything for the entire turn as a blanket. So it's very, very nice. It's like eff effectively a D barrier against Sky Striker and that sort. So you could also use it on your turn to prevent them from using the widow anchors, but just bear in mind it also negates your own cards as well. So just something to uh, keep mindful of. And then the last card I want to talk about is Eradicator epidemic virus this is a huge blowout against sky striker because you rinse their entire hand of spell cards it can be a little bad sometimes um when they chain like a linkage again and chain some things to get a monster on board and then they're able to recycle back the cards they they added so generally having eradicator with like some kind of even one Omnian Gate or one interaction is generally enough to win the game. Um, even off its own, Eradicator often just ends the game, but sometimes they're able to crawl back. So just like be aware of that. Don't invest all of your resources into making an Eradicator and tributing off a monster. But I think if your deck is good enough to play Eradicator, you can probably put up other negates. You probably have other cards in your hand, so it's probably more than better enough to play. So yeah, that's all I had about the Sky Striker. Um, if you guys have any tips for me on how we can also beat Sky Striker matchup together, then definitely let us know in the comments below. Other than that, we'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.